Constant Wonder Kids is a Constant Wonder podcast. Hi, Wonder Kids. It's Paige. How do you feel about being in the dark? For a lot of kids and grown-ups, too, the dark can be scary and disorienting. It's hard not to be able to see where you're going, and sometimes the dark makes normal things seem creepier than they really are. But what would you think if I said that the dark can allow us to see things that we wouldn't be able to see at all during the light of day? Things that may take our breath away. My mother-in-law, Emily Faust, was, she was more alert than the rest of us. We were all chasing babies and running around, but she, she had taken the time to really understand that we were seeing something very special. We were tired because we were hiking, we were swimming in the river every day, chasing babies, doing all that. So you really didn't stay up that late normally. But as soon as we ate, she would say, everyone, get the dishes done, put the babies to bed. The light show's about to begin. This is Lynn Faust. For years, she and her family would go to their cabin in an area called Elkmont in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This light show her mother-in-law wanted them to watch is one of those special things that you can only see in the dark. Can you guess what these lights are? A lightning bug or a firefly is not a bug and it's not a fly. It is a beetle, and a beetle means it has a hard covering. The cool thing about fireflies is everybody likes them. You know, most bugs, people scream and stomp on them and run away from them, or they think they're going to get bit or stung. But fireflies are completely harmless. And to almost anyone that was lucky enough to be a child growing up where they had fireflies, they have warm memories, happy memories, family and friend memories. If you guessed that the lights were fireflies, then you were right. Lynn grew up enjoying fireflies around her home in Tennessee, and especially at the family cabin in Elkmont in the 1960s and 70s. After a busy day, it was magical to sit around and enjoy the light show put on by the little bugs. There's a steep hillside outside of the porch, and we'd each grab a chair and have a blanket, and we would just sit there. And so a lot of people would come down in their pajamas to sit on our porch, (laughs) and then they'd have to walk back up the hill to theirs. The show outside of the Faust family cabin was especially interesting because the fireflies weren't just flashing their lights randomly. In most firefly populations, the insects light up at different times. But at the Faust cabin, the fireflies would all light up at exactly the same time, which looked like a train of lights in the sky. Scientists call this synchronous, which means happening at the same time. These synchronous fireflies were just part of the magic of the family summers at Elkmont, and Lynn didn't think too much about them during other times of the year. This all changed when she read an article in a magazine about fireflies in 1991. The cover of it had a firefly tree in Asia. I think it was in Malaysia. But I picked up the cover. I thought, oh, I bet they're going to tell me about the Elmont fireflies, the Elmont lightning bugs. And so I read the article, and that's when I read the line that there are no synchronous fireflies in the Western Hemisphere. The Western Hemisphere is the western half of the world, including North America, the United States, and most specifically, Elkmont, where Lynn and her family had seen all the synchronous fireflies flashing at the same time. It's like, well, wait a minute. I think that's what we've been watching all these years. So in those days, we had what was called a Tuesday night dinner. It was the entire Faust family, my husband's family, with Emily, my mother-in-law. And we would eat dinner together at her house every Tuesday night. And so after I read the article, I took the article in to Tuesday night dinner. And I said, how would you all describe what we watch on the porch at Elkmont? I thought, maybe it's just me. And But everyone gave the same answer and then it got hard it's like okay when do we actually see them and everybody got kind of quiet and somebody said well we don't see them after the fourth of july it's like okay and i mean we knew nothing and and what time somebody said well it has to be dark that's when emily makes us sit down and and i thought that's right it's always dark because there are some species that flash at dusk but these don't lynn and her family knew that the magazine article had to be wrong They had seen synchronous fireflies with their own eyes, so they knew that the rare fireflies existed in the United States. 
but it seemed like the scientists didn't know about them. First, I went to the park. I went down there to ask, and they just looked at me like I had two heads. So then she went to the local college. I went to the biology department. I thought, well, who does bugs? I, I, they'll know about it. And it was just blank looks. Nobody knew. I was in my 30s then. I believed that once you became an adult, meaning somebody 20 years older than I was at the time, that they knew everything and that all scientists knew everything and that all I needed to do was find that book about fireflies and then I could read about it. None of that existed, see? And now I know that no one knows anything and that adults are just bigger versions of kids and we're all wandering around trying our best. It seemed to Lynn that no one knew about the amazing fireflies she and her family watched at Elkmont, so she decided to write a letter. This was before email even existed. I thought, well, I'll write these scientists in this article. I'll, I'll get a hold of them and they'll know. Well, they didn't know either and they didn't believe me because I was some silly little housewife from Tennessee. But two of the scientists, John Copeland and Andy Moisef, agreed to come the next summer. I said, just come. I mean, just, this is really pretty neat. Before the scientists came to see lightning bugs, they wanted to know what the light flashes and baby fireflies looked like. So Lynn went to work, collecting samples and data just like a scientist. So they wanted me to collect larvae that fall. Larvae are the baby versions of fireflies before they turn into adults. I knew we had a lot of them up there. They were always around this creek that runs through our yard. And so at the time, I took our church youth group. I needed a bunch of kids with good eyes, you know, that are, can run around in the dark and not be f frightened. So I took about 10 kids up there. We spent the night. We had a great weekend. But their job was to catch larvae. And they did. And we caught like 125 larvae um, from right there and sent them to uh, Georgia Southern, where one of the uh, professors where John Copeland was at the time. The scientists were starting to believe what Lynn knew all along. There was something special about the fireflies at Elkmont. So the next summer, the scientists showed up, ready to see what Lynn had promised them. They arrived, and suddenly I had this moment of panic. You don't know what you don't know until you have to tell it to someone else. And then you realize how little you know. It's like, oh, gosh. I thought, well, what time do they come out? You know, uh, is it 9.30? Is it 8.30? Is it 10? And what if they're not out yet? You know, I thought, I know they're out in June generally. We stood there in the dark with these two northern professors who felt this little southern talking woman who had made them come. And it was just, there was nothing flashing. But it was not late enough. It, that Now I can tell you at 9.35, they start. But in those days, 30 years ago, I really didn't. It was just sort of like, well, they start when it gets dark. And, um, and so we stood there, and the feeling between the three of us was very uncomfortable. And then, thank goodness, a few began. And so they got all excited. Just seeing one or two, it's like, oh, hang on, you know, just wait. And then they all came out. And I've always thought God smiled on me that night because it was fairly early season. But that night was a beautiful display. From that night on, the scientists were super excited to come study the fireflies at Elkmont. And Lynn stayed right by their side, learning all she could about lightning bugs. She might not have started out as a scientist, but pretty soon she was just as much of a firefly expert as anyone else. I kept asking John and Andy questions about the life. That's what I was interested in. Like, do they mate more than once? How many babies do they have? You know, where are the larvae? And that's when I realized they didn't know either. Lynn read every single scientific paper that had ever been written about fireflies, and she began to observe the little creatures with a new perspective. Rather than just enjoying their beauty, she would watch the fireflies to figure out different species, their peak display times, and whether they were synchronous or not. We have uh, one species called the blue ghost, and, and when someone sees a blue ghost, they know that name from that day on. And they recognize them because they float and glow, and they're real low to the ground, and it, their glow is actually greenish, but it looks bluish the older you are, so people call them blue ghosts. 
and they're so magical and I guess in the 30 something years I've done this I've seen two super peaks of blue ghosts where you look out and the whole forest floor looks like the Milky Way or a blue moving cloud because there's so many of them I did a 3,000 mile trip finding new populations this year I went as far as East Texas and back and it was so fun walking into a place I've never been with no information was able to correctly find them that night at places that I didn't think I would but I thought they should be there and that's a real kick to see they're where you want them to be and uh, or where they should be but very specific habitats each display is is unique in its own way and it doesn't have to be synchronous there are beautiful displays you know where they're just out there flashing and it's usually the higher numbers are the most breathtaking Lynn's knack for finding beautiful firefly displays brings in a lot of emails from people who are interested to see a peak firefly night themselves. One time, she got an email from a young man who wanted to ask his girlfriend to marry him. To make the proposal extra romantic, he wanted there to be a synchronous firefly show lighting up when he asked her. Lynn helped him find a spot where there would be lots of fireflies, so off he went to propose. And then I started, I worry about everything. It's like, oh my gosh, what if she says no? This could be terrible. And, you know, he's gone to all this effort. But the boy took her there, the young man, and she said yes. A year or two later, they sent me a picture where, was it Halloween, I guess? They, they were insect people. And so they were dressed as praying mantises. And if you know about praying mantises, the female will bite the male's head off. And so it's an unusual insect to choose to show up as a couple in your costume. But they had a baby, a baby praying mantis. They had a little, a little baby by then. So I think, yeah, they lived happily ever after. Besides helping couples arrange romantic proposals lit up by beautiful fireflies, Lynn's pursuit of firefly knowledge has led her to amazing locations all over the world. I feel the magic almost anywhere I go when I see fireflies, particularly in, in great numbers. I have gotten to see the synchronous ones, or several of the species in, in Asia, in Thailand, and Malaysia, Borneo, Taiwan. It's magic no matter where you go. Lynn's adventures with fireflies have taken her all over the United States and the world. She's discovered new firefly species, written a book, and helped thousands of people enjoy the beauty of the outdoors. She might not have started out a scientist, but the Elkmont fireflies and her own curiosity have turned her into one. I feel like lightning bugs are little ambassadors to people. We're all inside at night. Everybody's looking at their phone, you know, or TV or whatever. And everybody's tired at night. You don't want to go do something else at night. But it pulls people back outside. And once they're outside, then they start realizing it is all connected. Spending time outside allows us to get to know the beautiful world around us, whether it's light or dark outside. You might not be an expert now, but just like Lynn, you could become a scientist by being excited and curious about the natural world. Magical firefly Glowing, floating in the sky Flashing, blinking, gets us thinking We can be scientists too Just a word or two now for parents. I'm Marcus Smith, host of Constant Wonder, the podcast from which Constant Wonder Kids originates. Constant Wonder, the original version produced for grown-ups, contains a whole lot of great stuff for kids, but it has rich detail of great interest to grown-ups as well. We suspect you may want to hear the original version devoted to Lynn Faust and her Firefly Discoveries. To hear this full presentation, access Constant Wonder wherever you get your podcasts. Look for the episode we've titled Glimmers of Awe, The Fascinating World of Fireflies. From there, it's just like giving a mouse a cookie because you'll want to have more. Enjoy episode after episode in your own ongoing quest for wonder in the world, anywhere and everywhere it can be found. 
Stay fully alive in this world by making room for wonder. Subscribe to Constant Wonder on your favorite platform. Constant Wonder Kids was produced by Paige Crumperman Darrington with sound design by Mitchell Towsley. Tenery Taylor is the executive producer. Constant Wonder Kids is a production of BYU Radio.